Well, good Sabbath, everyone. Good Sabbath. We continue this week in contemplating all that is contained in what is called the greatest commandment. Our passage is Mark 12 and verse 30. Mark 12 and verse 30. Jesus replies when asked that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And in our previous messages, we've covered loving God with our heart and mind. So today, we'll look at what loving God with, what our, with all of our soul means. However, before we dive into what loving God with all of our soul means, let's take a moment to try to understand what the actual word soul itself means. Now in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for soul is nefesh. It appears 755 times in the Old Testament. The two most common renderings in English are soul and life. Then in the New Testament, the counterpart to nefesh is psyche. We've heard that word before, right? Now, compared to nefesh in the Old Testament, psyche appears relatively infrequently in the New Testament. And psyche has a range of meanings that are very similar to nefesh. It frequently is translated as life. One can risk his life as we find in John 13, 37, Acts 15, 26, Romans 16, 4, and Philippians 2, 30. It's also translated as giving his life in Matthew 20, 28. Psyche is translated as laying down his life in John 10, 15, and 17 through 18, and forfeiting his life in Matthew 16, 26, and hating his life, a passage we talked about, Luke 14, 26. And finally, as in having his life demanded of him in Luke 12, 20. So clearly, whether it's the Old Testament or the New, there's a common theme about the word that we usually use for soul, nefesh in the Old Testament, and psyche in the New Testament, that it refers to life. In Genesis 2 and verse 7, we read that when God breathed the breath of life into Adam, he became a living soul, a human being, a living human being. You see, the human soul is central to the personhood or the identity of a human being. As George MacDonald has said, you don't have a soul, you are a soul. You have a body. In other words, personhood is not based on having a body, a soul is what is required. And repeatedly in the Bible, people are referred to as souls. Some examples are Exodus 31:14 and Proverbs 11:30. But especially in the context that focus on the value of human life and personhood, or on the concept of a whole being, the human soul is distinct from the heart and the spirit. We have passages that talk about the difference in the two. It's also different from the mind. The human soul is created by God and can be strong or unsteady. The soul can be lost or saved. We know that the human soul needs atonement and it is the part of us that is purified and protected by truth and the work of the Holy Spirit as Peter wrote in 1 Peter 1.22. He also wrote in verse 25 of that same chapter that Jesus is the great shepherd of souls. That's a different way to think about things. That our very personhood, our identity, if you will, is wrapped up in this concept of soul. It's our life force. It's what God breathed into us. If you turn to Matthew eleven twenty-nine. 29... You see that we can turn to Jesus Christ to find rest for what? Our souls. In Psalm 16, verses 9 through 10, is a messianic psalm that allows us to see that Jesus also had a soul. David wrote, Therefore my heart is glad, and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. 
For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. Now we know that he was not, David was not speaking of himself, as Paul pointed out in Acts 13, because David's body did see corruption and decay when he died. But Jesus never saw corruption, and he was resurrected. And his soul was not abandoned to Sheol, because Jesus, as a son of man, has a soul. Now that brings us to another question, and some of you may be thinking, what then is the difference between the soul and the spirit of a man? The soul and the spirit are two primary immaterial parts that Scripture ascribes to humanity. And it is confusing to attempt to discern the precise differences between the two. But I believe the word spirit refers only to the immaterial facet of humanity. Human beings have a spirit, but we are not spirits. However, in Scripture, only believers are said to be spiritually alive, as we find in 1 Corinthians 2.11, Hebrews 4.12, and James 2.26. While unbelievers, we are told, are spiritually dead in Ephesians 2.1-5 and Colossians 2.13. So the Spirit is the element in humanity that gives us the ability to have an intimate relationship with God. And whenever the word spirit is used, it refers to the immaterial part of humanity that is connecting with God, who himself is a spirit, as we're told in John 4.24. In contrast, the word soul can refer to both the immaterial and material aspects, aspects of humanity. Unlike human beings having a spirit, human beings are souls. And as previously discussed, in its most basic sense, the word soul means life. However, beyond this essential meaning, the Bible speaks of soul in many contexts. And one of these is in humanity's eagerness to sin. Human beings have a sinful nature. And our souls are tainted with sin. The soul, as the life essence of the body, is removed at the time of physical death. The soul, as with the spirit, is the center of many spiritual and emotional experiences. And the word soul can refer to the whole person, whether alive, on earth, or afterwards. So to be clear, the soul and spirit are connected but separable. This is why we read in Hebrews 4.12, The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit of joints and marrow and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The spirit is the immaterial part of humanity that connects with God and the soul is the essence of humanity's being. It is who we are. The soul is the immaterial part of our person which flows from which flow the actions, thoughts, desires and reasoning. It is separate from our physical body and part of the person that makes a person what and who he is. Alive, aware, able, and so forth. It's the essence of personhood, and biblical theology teaches that the soul is separate from the body and can exist independently of it, as you read in 2 Corinthians 5.8. So back to our passage today. Jesus was quoting here from Deuteronomy 6 and verse 5, that we are to love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind and our strength. And we know that our souls are alive and that we can despair and feel pain, be annoyed, grieved, be bitter, scorn or desire, hate or love, be troubled, be redeemed, be dismayed, praise, rejoice, desire evil, and even be weary. And there are passages of scripture that go with each one of those descriptions to say where they take that word, either nefesh or psyche, and talk about the soul being able to do these things. And when telling of this greatest commandment in Mark 12, 30, the point Jesus was making about loving God with all our soul, all of our life, all of our identity, is that our lives need to be guided by God and intertwined with his way of life. Albert Barnes's note on the Bible says, the phrase, with all your soul, 
means to be willing to give up the life to him and to devote it all to his service, to live to him and be willing to die at his command. God wants us to love him with all of our life essence, with all of our identity. To put it another way, to love God with all of our soul means that our activities and priorities in life are all geared around God and his way of life. As I pondered this, it became clear to me that loving God with all of my soul means to lose our identity to Christ. When my life essence is surrendered to his will, then everything defines me as a living being is wholly devoted to him. Then when others see me or see you, they will now see Jesus. Because that's what we reflect. The Apostle Paul refers to this in Galatians 2 and verse 20. He said, I have been crucified with Christ, which in and of itself talks about death, correct? It is no longer I then who live, but Christ who lives within me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He's saying this is how we love God with all of our soul. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. My life force, my essence, if you will, my identity now is wholly and completely Christ. Now some of us may have met a person or two in our life who attained at least some part of that status, right? Have you ever known a person who everyone said was a quote-unquote real Christian? Someone who people say about them that their faith is evident in every part of their life? That is at least a glimpse into the reality of what we are called into when Jesus said we are called to love God with all of our soul. We are called to love God with our life essence, our very identity, the source of our existence. In fact, this is what Paul was referring to when he wrote in Colossians 3 and verse 23, when he said, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Did you know if you go look in the Greek where it says work heartily, the words used there mean to work with all of your psyche. He's saying, devote every bit of your life force, your identity, as to the Lord and not to men. He's just expounding on what Jesus said about loving God with all of your soul. He's saying, everything you do, do it with all of your psyche, as for the Lord and not for men. And did you notice in Mark 12 and verse 30, that loving God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and with all of our strength, those things could have been said much more compactly, couldn't they? They could have been pushed together. Jesus could have said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Done. But he didn't do that. He didn't push them together. In fact, he separated them apart. Almost, if you will, to clarify the difference in them and to get us to understand the totality of this commandment. Of all that's required, he wants us to really love God with all of our being. That is the greatest commandment. You see, folks, God wants our all. God commands and demands our all. As I referred to earlier, Luke 14, 26 says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, and that word there is psyche, if he doesn't hate his own soul, he cannot be my disciple. Take a moment to chew on that. This is what Jesus said. This is his requirement. That our love for him 
must be so great, so far and above of our family, our loved ones, and even of our own life essence, our own identity, that in comparison, it looks like we hate our loved ones and we hate our very soul. Because if we don't, he says we can't be his disciple. In fact, I believe that's one of the reasons we sing, I surrender all. Because truly, salvation is the free gift that costs you everything. Jesus calls us to love God with all of our soul, our life essence, our identity. And he promises in Luke 17 and verse 33 that whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life will keep it. In order to truly love God with all of our soul, we are going to have to change the way we approach life. We're going to have to stop trying to forge our own identity in life. Make our own path, if you will, the American way. And instead, allow Him to be God in and of our lives. To the extent that all people see is Jesus. To love the Lord God with all your soul means to love Him in the way you live, in the choices you make, and in the behavior and lifestyle you adopt. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, forgive us for falling so short in loving you like you deserve. Thank you for covering this grievous sin by the precious blood of Jesus. We repent, Lord. Give us the grace to love you your Son, and your Holy Spirit with all of our soul. To give up our identity, Lord, whatever it takes, Lord, to increase our delight in you as the keeper of our souls. Lord, please open our eyes and hearts to all that you are and fill us with your Spirit and stir us to love you with all that we are. In the mighty name and for the sake of Jesus, amen.